morning, everyone. How, how is your day? How are you? Good doing? morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. I see Talal saying, yes, you can hear us since he was our last speaker. <laughs> sure. Great to see everyone. Uh, and it's really encouraging to uh, welcome everyone back uh, for uh, another exciting uh, virtual boardroom. Um, today, uh, as we do with uh, every uh, welcome, we'd like to first of all uh, thank uh, our host and our presenter um, from the ICT Fund, uh, Mr. Omar Omamud. Uh, we will uh, be introducing him formally in just one second. Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, all of our members uh, and organizations for being a part of uh, this new normal, this really this opportunity to stay connected uh, and to stay working together uh, and discussing important topics. Uh, a few reminders before we get started. Uh, please make sure that uh, you notify us uh, about your questions. You can do that a variety of ways. You can use the Zoom technology to raise your hand virtually. Uh, you can send a text uh, or a private message to me. Uh, or you can also WhatsApp me or send me an email, and we're monitoring all those. Uh, often we have more questions than we have time for at the end, uh, but we will get back to you directly as we have been uh, with emails to you uh, and with answers to your questions. A few other uh, points of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we will be recording this session for DSMC members and partners that were unable to join us today. And uh, thankfully, Omar has also uh, offered to provide the slides. So we hope that uh, you're able to watch uh, and not take notes. Uh, and so this is uh, really a subject, I think, uh, that's near and dear to many of our uh, uh, efforts in the UAE. And that is uh, the topic today, which is the ICT Fund, the UAE's Catalyst for Change. Our presenter today, Omar Al Mahmoud, is the Chief Executive Officer of the ICT Fund. Omar currently uh, is, a, a, as part of the ITC Fund, a federal development fund launched by the UAE's Telecommunication uh, Regulatory Authority with the purpose of catalyzing the ICT sector in the UAE through investments in education, research and development, incubation, and national technology initiatives. Omar has also been recognized as one of the youngest leaders in the UAE's public, public sector and is a multi-talented individual with deep and extensive insights on technology and investments and entrepreneurship. The ICT Fund is the investor behind the UAE's astronaut program, the Mars 2117 mission, the Smart Government Initiative, the Mohammed bin Rashid Smart Learning Program, the Drones and Robotics for Good Awards, in addition to many other bold initiatives. The ICT Fund has a determined mission to provide strategic, targeted funding to empower and develop innovation and build a knowledge-based economy for the UAE. Omar holds an honors degree in communications and engineering from Khalifa University for Science and Technology and Research, previously known as a Tesla University, and stems from an entrepreneurial background with deep technical expertise. Prior to Omar's role at the ICT Fund, he held many roles and responsibilities. Namely, Omar managed the Technology Investment Department at Dubai Silicon Oasis Authority, a strategic investment department where he identified high-tech investment opportunities and developed initiatives and incentive programs to attract technology-based companies to the UAE. Starting out as a technology entrepreneur, Omar has displayed entrepreneurial traits at an early age, leading him to occupy various roles in leading technology and prominent government positions at a very young age. Omar has presented his latest insights on the future of technology and the latest developments on weekly public radio show for over four years, in addition to his knowledge in the local and international landscapes that shape the technology ecosystem, Omar has given many talks on entrepreneurship and knowledge-based economies at many universities and events. And personally, I have had the honor of knowing uh, Omar for a number of years. Uh, one of our companies, in fact, participated in his Drones for Good. We've always uh, found a friend and, and a colleague to share uh, stories with and to seek support from. Uh, and Omar has not only uh, been a friend and, and a, 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 a 
person heavily involved in, in uh, the EUAE's economic development programs, but one day I had a Japanese delegation very recently before coronavirus, and we visited the ICT fund. And I knew that Omar was involved in a lot of things. But when we arrived and we did the introductions, Omar says, I have to share something with you because I'm very excited about it and I just landed and I just came straight to the office. Omar takes out his phone and shows us pictures of the launch site from where the first UAE astronaut launched from because he was there. And so when you talk about people that are involved in the cutting edge of where the UAE is going, not only in space, but in all technologies, uh, we're very honored to have Omar uh, presenting the topic today. And I know that you will uh, also agree that the ICT fund is the UAE's catalyst for change. Omar, with that, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you for the, uh, you can say, extended introduction. And um, I'm more than, of course, uh, uh, I do uh, value and treasure our relationship and our friendship. And of course, uh, more than happy to share with the whole world uh, what we've been doing here in the UAE and specifically with the ICD fund. And if you, if you, if you don't mind, uh, without delaying any further, I'm just going to pull up my, my slides and then we can take it from there on. Great. Thank you. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So, uh, with, with today's session, I'm going to talk today about the UAE's, the ICT fund, which is, uh, as we coin it, the UAE's catalyst for change. So, uh, what is a catalyst of change? Of course, um, as Matthew mentioned, um, the other day when we had the uh, Japanese uh, delegation that came over uh, with the SMC, uh, well, what I did showcase the other day was uh, was the actual launch. So, so any any change, uh, you can say any any change that happens in any society is based on a number of factors. So, so one of the factors uh, that the UAE is actually, you can say, uh, that is playing a prominent role in, in the UAE economy is, is the ICD fund. So I'm just gonna share this, uh, this, this awesome picture, which uh, was from the launch site. It was the, the actual launch of the first UAE astronaut. So with, with the, you can say, space rockets, of course, there is a catalyst of change that propels uh, the fuel propellant uh, at the back of the, of the rocket. So this, this picture, I'm gonna, what I'm going to talk about here is, is kind of the, is, is the summary of our investments, what we have achieved throughout the years ever since uh, starting the ICD fund. And I'll walk you through the story of how it came to be. And what was the backstory behind the ICT fund, and what does the ICT fund actually do? So, so the ICT fund, um, I'm just, uh, the ICT fund is actually as part of the Telecom Regulatory Authority, and and the telecom communication, you can say, sector in the country, is one of the biggest uh, sectors in the country. It's a, so we have a one of the highest uh, mobile phone penetrations in the in the world with over 170% mobile penetration. But when, when it comes to uh, the, the telecommunications sector, this sector uh, was one of the earliest sectors after oil and gas that was developed. And the, the UAE had, had, you can say, a, it didn't have legacy uh, infrastructure. So when we rolled out the, the fiber optics, the, the broadband, the, the, as we speak today in 2020, we're, we're rolling out the 5G network in the country. Uh, this, this network has catalyzed um, the whole economy. So everything depends today on, on the telecommunications sector. Today, especially with this pandemic, uh, the UAE is primarily dependent on, on the telecommunications sector. So today I'm talking to you, um, working from home, uh, and our, you can say, public sector uh, education system is actually all hosted on this telecommunication uh, network. So, so the telecommunication network is one of the biggest, um, you can say, markets in, in the UAE. And with that said, um, I'm just going to tell you that the, the telecommunication sector, which we have, is mandated or managed by the Telecommunication Regulatory Authority. 
why I'm bringing this up is the ICT was, was founded based on legislation set up uh, by the Telecommunication Regulatory Authority, so, which is the equivalent of the FCC in the US. So when, when, when the Telecommunication Regulatory Authority was set up, it was set up with, with, a, with a backstory of, of having a monopoly. So what, what did we have prior, prior to the TRA coming into existence? We only had one, one telecom operator, one telco in the UAE, and that was, that was Ittasalat. And Ittasalat is one of the biggest uh, telecom companies that has global reach. They own about 17 overseas operations uh, ranging from Africa to Southeast Asia. They've acquired a lot of companies across the globe in telecommunication and they've expanded beyond the ge geographic location of the UAE, uh, spinning over into Saudi, Egypt, India, and the African continent, in addition to Southeast Asia and Indonesia and the rest. So, so when, the, when, when this sector uh, was developed, it was developed based on a, a company that was owned by, by the UAE government, which was called the Tsala. And there was no regulatory body to manage this company. So what happened was um, in 2004 and 2005, uh, a notion of ha opening up the market to having a second player come into the market. So what happened was we, we split the market here in the UAE as a government and thus come into the market and a second player, which was called Do Telecom. So Do Telecom came into the market, thus creating the need to have a, a centralized body to regulate the spectrum, to regulate the frequencies, to regulate the infrastructure, which is now public property, and now and not owned by one private company. So, so what happened was the TRA was created. So the TRA, uh, which is a federal, a federal government entity, uh, was created to regulate the market from everything ranging from the technical specs to the spectrum, in addition to even the revenue, the revenues that come in from the telecom sector. So what happened was um, the telecom sector uh, was mandated to pay a 1% revenue fee on any telecom operator that exists in the country, thus creating what we call the IC, ICT fund. So with, with the long-term, you can say, mandate or long-term strategic uh, mandate to develop the sector, and instead of focusing primarily on sales for each, each company, um, the TRA said, let us create a fund. And this fund would then they are on develop the ICT sector from all, from all aspects and not just from a telecom operator perspective, but with regards to everything ranging from education to R&D to infrastructure and to national technology initiatives. So, so the story of the ICT fund is we are, we are basically 1% of every telecom operator's revenue on an annual basis. So with, with, with all this revenue coming in, we asked ourselves as ICT Fund, when we started back in 2007, so what do we do now? How do we go about and develop the ICT sector? So the ICT sector is, is a very broad term and it encompasses a lot of, you can say, uh, niches such as, for example, you have the smartphone, uh, you have the fiber optics, you have the broadband, you have the internet space, uh, you have the uh, web space with the telecom, uh, with the internet startups, and you have the R&D centers, you have a lot of broad, you can see, niche uh, sub-markets. But I see the fund was an all-encompassing uh, uh, body which manda was mandated to develop this sector. So. So with this mandate back in 2007, when we became operational uh, and revenue started coming in, we asked ourselves, how, how about do we go about and develop this ICD sector? So one of the things we, we went about to do was, how, how does the rest of the world um, do this? So one of the things we saw was, we looked at different, different models. We looked at the US model. We looked at um, the Asian model, China, South Korea. Uh, we looked at also Singapore, we looked at Ireland, we looked at an, a number of nations uh, across the globe. And we looked at best practices, how do each of these um, countries and nations develop their ICT sector. 
So we picked from all of the best and we benchmarked, um, you can say, a lot of uh, global initiatives, a lot of global bodies. Uh, we looked at uh, the FCCs, we looked at um, what they call the universal uh, technology uh, funds, uh, which are which which is a common theme across uh, across the globe. It's not it's not primarily unique to them, to the to the UAE. But what we think is unique about the UAE is the way we went about and do it. Uh, what we did with with the revenue stream, uh, we expanded a lot of you can say uh, aspects of the ecosystem here in the country, and we developed a lot of you can say long term uh, strategic initiatives that we are. Luckily, uh, in this short time, uh, which we've been in existence, are actually reaping in the, the benefit. Uh, maybe that's just due to the factor of uh, the UAE as a nation uh, being very agile and young, and uh, not being, you can say, um, having a lot of incumbent infrastructure, which could uh, hamper a lot of uh, development out there. So, so uh, we looked at uh, all these countries and we came up with this uh, four pillar strategy uh, which we came and we devised. And we think this four pillar strategy is the actual recipe for success for the projects which I'm going to share with you today. And we think this is the way uh, forward for other, other countries, companies, nations, corporations, startups, even on a personal level, uh, individuals to base, uh, to benchmark or base uh, uh, their, you can say, their, their journey to, towards success and progress. So, so we come up, we came up with um, with four investment strategic pillars to build this ICT sector in the country. So we said we're going to focus on education. Of course, education is is prime, and everyone is knows the value of education. With education, you can roll out research and development once you have enough human capital talent. Uh, with research and development, of course, you can create an industry. With startups and incubation and companies and corporations and of course national initiatives uh, and technology uh, that have a spillover effect uh, on all verticals across uh, the economy so so these four investment pillars uh, based on that benchmark which we looked at is our investment strategy so all our investments are under one of these four pillars and these four pillars um, are actually the building blocks of a building a knowledge-based society. And I'm gonna share how, how the ICD Fund um, has been doing this uh, ever since the, the inception of the ICD Fund back in 2007. So, so we went about to discuss, um, so we went about to discuss how do we build enough capable uh, human capital talent and skill sets in the country. Given that the UAE's population is a small population, uh, it's, it's around 9.5 million, but with only about uh, 1 million uh, UAE nationals. And, there, and the ambition of the country is to actually take it to the next level. So one of the KPIs we have for Vision 2021 is to be uh, one of the top uh, 10 uh, innovative countries on the innovation index. So one of the 2021, um, uh, you can say, um, KPIs, which we have set, if, if you look at the vision, the UAE's vision 2021, is to be one of these uh, top 10 countries. And to do that, of course, you'd need uh, to invest in human capital. So what we did is we launched a, one of our, it was our, you can say, our starting program. So we started our first investment with sending uh, students abroad to study technology. And, and that was where we, our scholarship program came. And it's one of the uh, leading and the most, um, you can say, prominent scholarship programs here in the country. Another thing we looked at was how do we create for students um, and those seeking to become or our human capital investments, how, how can we uh, foster enough, you can say, innovation and having the right uh, educational ecosystem in front of them for them to excel and exceed when it comes to the universities we have in the country. So one of the things is we we invest in our universities, in our academic, uh, academic you can say, uh, uh, institutes here in the country by setting up laboratories and centers of excellence related to technology. This was under education. Moving on, once you have enough human capital generated uh, as a nation, you can there, there on 
um, and with the right skill sets, they don't start developing your research projects. And with the research projects, the, the outcomes or our ROI, which we are seeking to invest uh, or ROI to, to base our investments on, is to actually see how, what is the intellectual property that's being generated based on these uh, research projects, which we are in, in investing in. We also set up centers of excellence once we had enough uh, projects that have been uh, deployed. We looked at how can we then become as a focal point for talent from across the globe and to partner up even with partners in the region, with different countries across the globe, is by setting up centers of excellence or R&D centers here. So, so that was under, uh, you can say under R&D, is once you have enough talent in terms of human capital, once you have enough R&D projects as experience, you can thereon become a, a focal point or a center of excellence in a specific theme. So that was another, you can say, um, that was another, you can say, uh, a milestone which we defined for our strategy and, and I'm gonna share more under each title, what we've been doing under these uh, specifically. Moving on, um, we also looked at providing, you can say, the right, uh, you can say, ecosystem or uh, environment for UAE nationals to launch their technology related startups being hardware or software. So we came up with a number of programs to support uh, startups. And also, not just in startups, but to actually uh, provide the funding for incubators to, to launch uh, in the country across uh, different Emirates for uh, UAE nationals and, and expats and people in the UAE to actually launch their companies here uh, in the UAE with support uh, from the federal and local governments. And of course, uh, finally, um, we, we, we also came up with this um, strategic pillar, which is national initiatives, is we looked at also um, the, the, moon, um, the moon mission, the Apollo moon mission, and how, it is, how that, that mission actually um, rallied the whole nation behind a, 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 a single cause. So once you have a, a call, or you can say a call of arms to, to do a, a project which involves everything from uh, medical science to technology to, to, to education to, to a lot of different verticals. We thought that the spillover effect would, you can say, would exponentially uh, create a lot of change which we're trying to achieve uh, and versus going doing it one by one through the three different pillars I just explained, such as education, R&D, and incubation and entrepreneurship. But with this, with this, with having a moonshot as a national rally point, uh, you'd see a lot of change happen, happening dramatically and exponentially uh, in exponential time. So, so that's, uh, that is our fourth uh, pillar. So once, once we, as I, as I mentioned, um, uh, once you put all these together, the scholarships, the, the investments in laboratories, the, the investments in R&D projects, investments in R&D centers, the investment in the startups and incubators and national initiatives, and you, you basically reap um, the benefit of having, in, you're having the outcomes measured against human capital. How many UN nationals do we have that are talented or have enough skill sets to do this or that? Uh, such as today, uh, we build our own um, satellites. Uh, we have, uh, we're, we're just about to embark on a Mars mission. I'm gonna share more about that. Uh, building the right educational infrastructure in the country, uh, triggering, you can say, enough intellectual property to become a center of excellence, thus creating enough jobs and talents, launching an industry, and of course, finally, um, being a trailblazer for moonshots uh, across the globe. So that is kind of um, our, our theory or our philosophy on how about do we go to develop an ICT, uh, an ICT sector or build a nation uh, at the end of the day. So once you put all that together, uh, you can of course ultimately do moonshot after moonshot after moonshot. So, so to, um, I'm going to share some of these uh, moonshots today, hopefully, and we hopefully you find them you find them interesting so when when we looked at uh, measuring roi or talking about investments so the icd fund 
uh, just to clarify, uh, doesn't actually uh, look at financial returns. All our all our returns are based on uh, the the you can say the term, the terminology which I just shared was either human capital or infrastructure or having an industry here in the country. So everything is based on uh, we use that um, measuring stick. Does it create enough human capital uh, in terms of UAE nationals? Does it, uh, does it create enough intellectual property of this project we're going to invest in? Or does it create uh, infrastructure change, which will then enhance previous, you can say, uh, efforts or future efforts under education or R&D or, or create an industry? So those are, uh, those are our, you can say, metrics. How does the ICT fund think? How does it work? And how does it invest? So based on purely strategic ROI, no financial ROI is looked at. Uh, because most of the, uh, because we have a, again, a revenue stream that is, that is coming in based on legislation and based on policy to develop the ICT sector. So to start with our investments, so one of the, uh, one of our major investments, and we'll, we're, we're very proud to reap the benefit of this investment was the, the Mohammed Barashid uh, Smart Learning Program. So the Mohammed Barashid Smart Learning Program was uh, launched by uh, His Highness the Prime Minister, where in 2012, um, the UAE wanted to uh, catalyze its educational system. Thus, this program was introduced as a, again, a catalyst of change, where we wanted to introduce change on all aspects and all levels uh, of, of the educational system here in the country. So one was when we looked at, um, we looked at how does the student interact with, uh, with the learning material, and then, how does the um, these uh, how does the uh, teach or the teaching uh, faculty uh, also manage a classroom, and how do how can we introduce change there? And how does the the Ministry of Education and the you can say the departments of education manage their schools uh, remotely? So so we looked at all of those uh, aspects, and we then started to introduce change on all aspects. So we introduced change between the student and his uh, learning materials. So we introduced the tablet in between as a hybrid, you can say, uh, learning uh, approach. And then secondly, we also introduced change with the learning materials. So the learning material is, isn't static anymore. It's actually uh, dynamic and active, and, they can, and the student is actually uh, looking at the, uh, the material, and they can click on it. And of course, on the backhand side, what we've been doing is we've been measuring all of this at the, at the, at the backhand side. So we've been looking at uh, digital stuttering, for example. Do students uh, move the cursor to one, uh, to one answer and then move to another answer? Uh, for example, um, what is the shortcomings of a specific student for this material? And based on, for example, what, uh, from, what, what, did the, what caused that gap or that um, uh, for example, uh, what caused that um, shortcoming in understanding uh, with that student? So we measure all of that. And thus, what the whole goal is of measuring everything is to come up with what we call um, an adaptive learning system. So an adaptive learning system, if I'm going to summarize this project and close with that, with this project, um, or with the slide on this project, is, is this, this graph. At the whole, the, our, uh, this whole graph, or this whole, whole project was ultimately based on this formula, which is how can we keep memory retention or how can we keep learning material retention based on digital, uh, you can say, interactions and then showcase that digital interaction based on every student's shortcoming or skill set custom made per student. So, so with that said, the, 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 the smart learning program is to actually measure every student's um, capability, and then present to every student, based on their own skill set, um, the project or uh, the learning material. So uh, that project is, as we are very blessed today, uh, and, the, and once um, here in the UAE, when we had the pandemic to, to hit the ground running with the public sector, where everyone was already on board when it came to their learn, learning material being digitized, having the devices out, out and about in the classrooms are now at home with every student. And one of the things about this project is it was the only countrywide project that was deployed. And it was based, uh, and, and when we looked at different countries, we only saw either 
uh, citywide initiatives or statewide initiatives, but this was based on uh, a countrywide initiative and it's been a case study um, being discussed um, in, in major, you can say, economic uh, or educational forums, uh, where how can you take a, a legacy educational system and convert it to a hybrid educational system? When I say hybrid, the reason is uh, we don't want to remove the, the writing skill sets uh, by hand or the motor skill sets of the students, but ultimately, uh, based on technology, keep the, you can say, the study or the learning material uh, retention up and about and measured and, and you can see deployed. Moving on, um, when it comes to education, of course, um, we've been sending students uh, abroad uh, ever since 2008 till today. We have our, we're very proud to have um, first uh, UE National who've been accepted to MIT. Uh, we've also been sending students, uh, not just at uh, MIT and, and the US, but all across uh, the globe. Some people in, in, in Japan, some people in Korea, and we have been, uh, you can say, generating enough human capital today that today those, those students are actually leading uh, government initiatives here in the country or major technology initiatives in the country or government entities. So, so what, this is another uh, example of what the ICD Fund is doing under education. Uh, moving on to R&D. So uh, one of the uh, key, you can say, uh, in, investment, you can say, um, 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 milestones we've been trying to, to reach is, is having an R&D center. So we've, uh, we've, been, uh, we've, been we've been deploying a lot of uh, funds for uh, doing R&D projects. So we have done that with a number of universities here in the country. But uh, recently in the couple of, few, uh, in the couple of years um, prior to 2020, uh, we've been setting up R&D centers. So one of the key, you can say, R&D centers we've been, uh, we've been um, you can say funding is uh, we set up the National Center for Space Technologies and Sciences. This is in collaboration with the uh, space, the UAE Space Agency, and also in collaboration with uh, the UAE, UAE University, which is the state university here in the country. So, so this National Center for Space Technology is uh, when it was when the concept was devised. Um, it was based on um, having a a home for the Emirates Mars mission. And if those um, who are aware or those who are not aware of the Emirates Mars mission, uh, the Emirates Mars mission is, uh, is the Mars probe. Uh, we have the UAE Mars probe, which is called the Amal, which means um, hope, but that's a literal translation. Uh, Amal is more, uh, is a broader term. It has a lot of a deeper meaning than just hope. Uh, it has a wishful, you can say, a hopeful uh, thinking uh, included in it. So uh, the Mars probe is a UAE probe that is, that, that is about to be launched into space. And it's been built uh, by Emirati hands who are the students who have been uh, sending abroad uh, or even studying uh, in our UAE, UAE universities. And together uh, for the past, um, you can say um, eight years, they've been building the, the Mars uh, probe. So the, the, the Mars probe, is, uh, is, um, is, is, is about to be launched. Uh, this is a picture of it. It's about to be launched uh, from Japan. I would advise um, you to watch uh, the launch of the first uh, Arab uh, probe that is going to Mars. And we are very proud of having uh, done this and built this uh, by UAE National Hands, by young um, engineers, um, and uh, both male and female. Um, the uh, the deputy manager of the program is actually uh, is a young uh, engineer, and she's the minister, uh, the minister of advanced sciences at the same time. So we have a lot of you can say um, youth. Uh, they are they are actually being put to the test to actually build, uh, as I mentioned, moonshot pro pro programs and initiatives. And we're we're very grateful that uh, that we've been time and time again showcasing that yes, it can be done. And we don't know. We we don't know no as an answer. We can always do it, even if we don't know how to do it as a country um, that is very young. So we're about to preach uh, uh, arrive at our 50th anniversary next year, hopefully, inshallah. Uh, so this is uh, another picture of uh, the Mars probe being uh, loaded uh, onto a special uh, aircraft that that's being flown to uh, to Japan. So the team. Uh, the Mohammed Bin Rashid uh, Space Center team 
uh, is actually there in Japan, uh, getting uh, getting the Mars probe uh, ready for for the launch. Hopefully on the, on the 14th of July, and I invite everyone here uh, to keep um, you can see to keep tuned to uh, the launch day. And because we're hopefully, I mean, inshallah, nothing happens when when it comes to weather. So so weather is uh, is another you can say uh, factor. Uh, which we're very wary of uh, when it comes to the launch uh, with the launch uh, phase. Uh, moving on, to, um, another you can say uh, um, example of uh, having a, a moonshot or a national um, initiative was the UAE M government. Uh, this was uh, back in 2013 uh, when the Prime Minister announced that um, the future of government is it has to be 24 hours and it's seven day a week. And it's, it provides everything through the mobile phone uh, at the uh, at 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 your basically at your fingertips instead of you coming in to um, to come into to the government department to finish whatever uh, government uh, procedure or formality you need to do. So so he one of the pivotal moments was uh, when he raised the phone and he said, uh, "We need to get this done. We need everyone to be on on their phones here." And this was done in. In, in a session where all government, uh, all heads of governments were, were sitting, and he announced a two-year deadline, a race basically, for for every government department to have a smart app. And uh, well, luckily everyone did because um, uh, at at the end of his uh, session, he did say, "Those who do not make it to the two-year deadline, um, we would have to bid them farewell in a farewell party because if they're not ready to move on to the next." iteration of government management, then we can. And uh, you can actually dig up his tweet, which he publicly said that, uh, but he only said it in Arabic. The English tweet, they, they, they didn't translate it. So everyone did, and uh, we're very proud today and have, uh, having a, a very agile and robust uh, government, given um, you can do a lot of things uh, through your mobile phone, if not everything. And, and that uh, today, especially with the pandemic, um, has proven that yes, our our early investment has actually today in this time and age, when with everyone or everything being online, uh, we are back to the reap the benefit of having a government that that is available through the phone without every anyone uh, actually being in there in person. Another you can see example of a, a, a national initiative we've done is the FedNet, which is a federal network that connects uh, all the uh, government entities together for exchanging of data uh, through uh, through um, you can say a digital or a, what we call the government bus, where all data is securely exchanged and encrypted uh, through the federal network. Another example uh, is the Ankabut Pro, uh, Ankabut National R and D Network. Uh, this is a an academic uh, network, which is a non commercial network uh, that has a dedicated um, infrastructure and it connects all the uh, ac academic entities here in the country together with even uh, academic, you can say, networks abroad. The whole purpose of this network was to have um, the processing power, um, which is available idle on all computers in all the all the universities in the country, being uh, dedicated towards an R&D project uh, for any member or user of this R&D network. Uh, another another program we've been or pro project uh, I would highly advise um, attendees to to dig up and visit their website is the World Government Summit is where we we host uh, from across the globe heads of states uh, thinkers philosophers uh, rel religious leaders uh, and everyone to come up and see how can we um, push forward um, the the wheel of humanity together collectively in terms of uh, what does it take to to, to increase longevity, how, does, how can our health improve, how can our governments improve, how can anything related basically to all human beings uh, improve. So heads of state attend this, um, it's very, it's, forma uh, it's format is similar to the World Economic Forum, uh, but it's hosted uh, on an annual basis here uh, in the UAE. And they have publications, I would, they are highly sought after of, uh, publications, I would, uh, advise and recommend everyone to see the reports and dig into the information that is being presented there. And what, what does the future look like when it comes to technology, health, governments, uh, the landscape, even when it comes to political uh, aspects. 
the UAE Drones and Robotics Awards uh, was an interesting um, it was an interesting endeavor, and we were, we were very honored to have Matthew uh, participate and partake there uh, in the awards. Uh, I was actually personally rooting for for Matthew, uh, but I was not part of the um, technical committee that judged the teams. But uh, to give you insight, what does the UAE Drones and Robotics um, uh, Good Awards? Uh, so the the concept of the awards was to how can we use drones or robotics to benefit humanity? Um, initially, when this was it was to be honest, it was um, the prime prime minister's uh, concept. He he saw a drone for the first time um, in 2014, and he was extremely intrigued by having a drone uh, hover in midair uh, inside a building. And he asked, "What does what does a drone do, and what is the purpose of a drone, etc.?" And he's briefed by his entourage um, that a drone is primarily used in defense, and it does have um, in that period of time a uh, you can say a bad reputation when it comes to uh, loss of life of civilians. So he said, "Why can't we?" use it to showcase that yes you can use drones in outside uh, defense industries and actually serve human lives instead of uh, harm some human lives so so he came up with the uh, the concept of awarding uh, a million million dollar prize award for best application of drone and in addition in the second year to come uh, for robotics or automated uh, you can say vehicles or automated um, ubiquitous uh, devices robotics vehicles whatever it may be and then on a local front, uh, we also provided a million dirhams. So um, I'm showcasing um, uh, Matthew here. And he, he actually came up and maybe at the end of uh, my session, he can explain more about the, uh, you, um, the URS, uh, you can say rover system, which is the uh, autonomous uh, rover system, which can be used at the front lines. Uh, this, uh, this rover, uh, is extremely. I was I was extremely uh, intrigued by all the functionality it has, and I let Matthew, uh, since he was, uh, uh, you can say, the the star of the show that day, uh, showcase more about uh, what 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 it can do and how he and how he can actually discuss about this uh, this rover. Uh, another example, of course, we did see a lot of um, water water robotics. Uh, some of the participants uh, they came up with these. Uh, robotics uh, which go underwater for different missions uh, and fire rescue a lot of a lot of applications when it came to robotics so this was done on an annual basis we would give um, uh, a one um, you could say winner takes all approach but there's just one winner with the best application and they would showcase their their innovation or uh, invention in a similar capacity to to a DARPA uh, competition Moving on, oh yeah, this was uh, this was the winning. Um, <laughs> this is who Matthew um, unfortunately lost to. Uh, so Open Bionics, um, um, Open Bionics is a startup uh, based out of the UK. Uh, they print three D printed uh, materials for bionic uh, limbs and arms uh, at an extremely, you can say, a low cost. And they can be actually um, they, they, their target audience was to actually provide this for children who have actually lost limbs or are born without limbs. And they can custom meet it based on their favorite Marvel heroes. For example, Iron Man. They can have um, lights uh, coming out of the uh, robotic limb, and you, you can actually can. Um, and they are actually controlled by um, the uh, the signals which are generated by your nervous system. So the nervous system uh, signals are actually measured, and then based on your specific body's um, 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 electrical. Uh, you can say uh, uh, signals which are emitted by your skin. Uh, this you can create, uh, control the the actual limb uh, which you have. So th these are uh, another example we had on the years prior was the uh, Sutex, uh, which is a, um, a, a suit that was um, uh, by UC Berkeley, which allowed the par uh, paraplegic uh, uh, patients to actually walk back again. And this was um, uh, <laughs> this was the winning uh, one million uh, USD, and you can see one of the team members actually doesn't have a an actual a limb. He used his arm to uh, receive the check and also shake hands um, with the conference of Dubai that day. Uh, moving on, so one of our you see five flagship programs was the UAE astronaut program, and I'll uh, explain briefly about the program and share some 
some insight on what, what we're trying to achieve with this program. So this program is actually uh, uh, in partnership uh, with the uh, Mohammed Rashid uh, Space Center here in, here in the UAE. Um, Mohammed Rashid Space Center is the, I would say the technical um, powerhouse of the space program here in the UAE, in addition to the, the UAE Space Agency. So um, to walk you back through what, what the, how this program came into being. So, so back in 1976, um, uh, our, our late uh, founding father, Sheikh Zayed, he, in 1976, the UAE was only five years old. And, and he, was, he, was, um, he was actually, he actually invited the, the Apollo, you can say, team who, um, who were, who, who've been to the Moab, and uh, they've actually brought back with, with them uh, a moon rock, which was presented to, to His Highness back in 1976 to this fledgling nation uh, of the UAE. And, and, and in front of him was this model of the, uh, the space shuttle, which wasn't actually deployed back in 1976. It was five years prior to that. And they were showcasing um, to His Highness uh, back in the day how um, space uh, launches are going to happen uh, for the years to come. And um, this, this meeting was fostered by uh, Dr. Farouk Al-Baz, who was uh, also a, <laughs> uh, Dr. Farouk Al-Baz is a NASA, uh, NASA scientist who, is, who actually uh, has Arabic heritage. And he fostered the, back in the 70s, this meeting. And he was also part of our Drones Awards uh, as part of the judging panel uh, today. So, so, so this, so he's actually, and then he was, he was asked, how can we, how can people go to space? So that was a, a prolonged question, which um, we didn't see the answer except recently with, uh, with today's generation. And we're very blessed that uh, this program, which we had for, uh, for this astronaut program uh, on, on, the, on the left was uh, our first astronaut, uh, Hazar Mansouri here uh, prior to launching. So Hazza, um, the, his mission was called the uh, Tumuh Zaid, which means the, the ambition of Zaid. So in the 70s, he said, uh, His Highness Sheikh Zaid, one day, hopefully, we'll get there. And his, you can say, um, his sons actually managed to do that in a very short time period. With, uh, just to give you an example um, of where our parents came from. So, so my parents um, grew up without any electricity back um, uh, in the day when they were growing up. And I asked my mother, how do you actually sleep in the heat and the humidity? So her answer was, was simple. Uh, all we do is we pour water on, on our clothes and sleep on the rooftop of our mud houses. So, so to, just to show you like the sheer um, transformation of lifestyle that has happened in a period of one generation, our parents' generation, who are, we're blessed to have them today. Um, and see all this change and reach for the stars as, uh, and, as nothing is impossible, as I say. So uh, Hazar Mansouri was our first astronaut. We, um, this was the logo of the mission, uh, which was the Zayed, and it has um, a, the bust of uh, the late founder and showed that, yes, we can uh, put his name up just like he imagined one day that we'd, we'd go there, hopefully one day. And we're, we're very proud to to have uh, uh, been part of that program. And I was actually, <laughs> the other day when we had Matthew over uh, at our offices, I was I just arrived, I just came back from, from the launch site of that uh, phenomenal, you can see, historic uh, mission which we had. Uh, and this, these are some of the uh, photos of, of the actual launch uh, of the Soyuz rocket. Um, we were extremely worried that day. The reason is um, the prior mission of the Soyuz rocket uh, actually had a, a, you can say a, cat a catastrophic fail where the two astronauts who were going up there were actually ejected. And it's one of the rarest, you can say, uh, incidents that the, the Russian or Roscosmos actually had. Uh, they, they almost had next to uh, zero, you can say, incidents. So we were very, you can say, um, on, our, uh, on the edge of our seats, hopefully, and just praying that everything goes fine. Alhamdulillah, everything went up perfectly fine. He arrived at the ISS and, and those moments, I mean, waiting confirmation that he has been, he's arrived outside the atmosphere. And just to showcase, or just to go back, even, even the sheer power of the sound and, and the, the, the brightness of, of the launch uh, just resonates across the horizon 
and it's almost as if the sun is uh, is on is on the ground when it launches. Uh, he, alhamdulillah, he arrived uh, at the ISS uh, safe and sound, and he had about sixteen scientific missions. He's been um, he's been uh, mandated to do from uh, different universities from across the globe. So there's a call for proposal on. Uh, different uh, R&D projects uh, to, or experiments or scientific, uh, scientific experiments to be tested out in space, ranging between uh, DNA testing to, um, um, uh, how would say, planting seeds or how would, um, planting UAE um, uh, seeds or well, the, date, the, the palm dates um, are here in the country and then seeing what effect would it have once uh, those seeds come back to ground, et cetera. And you can see the website uh, of the uh, Mohammed Barash Space Center, you see the list of the uh, scientific experiments he's done. Uh, one of the <laughs> funniest moments is here. So um, what we did is we, we, had the, um, we had our food, our native food, uh, being uh, shipped to space so of course there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things that go into food before and testing when it comes to how, how long does this food uh, take um, uh, to make how 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 can it uh, you can say um, react to atmospheric pressure and how can it be uh, saved for an extended period of time so here in Hazar is actually um, <laughs> inviting um, the crew there to our food uh, I do have um, here with me in my room, a uh, sample of the food, but I haven't opened it because I just want to keep it as um, a memento. Uh, but this is uh, what we call asrida, uh, which is a, a, a typical uh, UAE national native food. And in addition to all these uh, blue uh, cans, which have our uh, food there. And uh, he came back uh, happily, as they say, uh, safe and sound and smiling and, and celebrated as a national hero. And we're very blessed to be part of that, uh, that initiative uh, here in Hazza. Uh, another, another you can say, exciting um, a, a project we've been part of and we're funding is the Mars 2117 uh, uh, initiative, which is the, it's two, uh, 2117 stands for the year in 2117, where this project was launched in 2017. It's basically a, a, a series of, uh, initiative and uh, projects where hopefully by 2117 uh, the whole goal and my, uh, ambition is to have uh, some sort of Mars presence uh, for or the UAE would have some sort of Mars presence um, up there uh, on Mars. So so this project uh, was announced in 2017 at the World Government Summit uh, by His uh, Highness the Prime Minister and the Crown Prince of uh, Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Hamad bin Zayed, uh, was to foster, you can say, an era of international collaboration to arrive at Mars uh, collectively as, uh, as, a, as, as a planet or as a, uh, a set of nations instead of having different individuals um, taking inspiration from the International uh, Space Station. So, so this, this initiative um, uh, primarily has um, one where we have the Mars city and we're going to talk about that. And uh, prior to that, um, have uh, what they call the step one, the analog mission. So today, as we speak, um, there's an analog mission, which is to simulate uh, life on Mars. Uh, so this is a facility in Russia where um, the first, you can say, uh, mission under the 2117 initiative is to have a, uh, 10, 10 volunteers being um, uh, sent over to live in this uh, facility to simulate uh, what would it take to live on Mars and grow your own food without having uh, external uh, interaction with outside world. So this, uh, so this, this mission has, uh, uh, has been deployed and we have uh, 10 volunteers already uh, identified and shortlisted. And they're, they're going to be sent um, to Russia to simulate for eight months uh, what would it take to live on Mars. But with that said, uh, we're also building a, a similar f a facility here uh, in the UAE uh, on the Emirates Road, uh, which is to simulate not just uh, life on Mars, but also to do a different number of experiments uh, in, in, a, in a dome structure or a similar structure to what you see as this uh, artist illustration, uh, to simulate what, um, what would it take to live for even extended more periods of time. And given that um, a Mars uh, 
colony would look similar to what we have here in this picture. So drafts, uh, the plan has been drafted uh, to set up or build this, uh, this facility on Emirates Road. Uh, we're just doing the final, uh, as we say, the final um, uh, sign-offs from the local government in Dubai to actually secure uh, the land and also sign and the, the architects and the construction company being tendered and this being deployed here in the country. So, so with that said, I'm going to wrap up what, what it would take to, again, um, be a catalyst of change or develop an ICT sector or have a knowledge-based society. Again, I'm just gonna reiterate what I shared earlier, which is that, of course, you need to primarily focus on education, either on a personal uh, individual level or even on a company level or a team level or even a whole across a whole nation. Of course, no one, if you don't keep doing research or discovering what is out there uh, to discover uh, what, what you can do uh, next, then how would you come about to launch an industry and set up companies and have economic, you can say, growth? But of course, um, to shortcut or to, you can say, um, have all of that and have everyone rally behind a, a single cause and create enough education, R&D projects and industries is to have a national initiative, um, just like uh, when the US uh, the Apollo mission to, to, to send a man to the moon and had all universities, everyone partaking in that um, uh, call uh, forums to, to get uh, that man up there uh, on, on the moon. And we've taken that in, in this time and age uh, where everything is, is connected, everything is ubiquitous and everything is agile. Uh, thus, you can see a faster pace of change in even in less than a generation's timeline. Uh, of course, when you put all that together, you, you result in actually building a nation. But before before I go and close my, my, my slides here to build a nation, uh, here in the UAE, um, we have this, I would so call the self-fulfilling um, prophecy, and I would recommend everyone to adopt it as a mantra, is if you, if you have a belief that, yes, you can do that, uh, even if you have nothing, you just set the expectations that, yes, we can, um, we, we should do this because there is an expectation, um, even leveraging on the Arabic concept of in, intolerance of failure. So to, to leverage that, instead of having it as a point of weakness, we just use it as a point of leverage is that, no, there is an expectation to succeed and there's no other option. You have to, you have to succeed. So instead of having this, this Arabic concept of, of hiding failure or or as we call uh, keeping face or having uh, an honor issue, either with family with that, leverage it to, to influence behavior, thus then creating the results which, which we see. And so once you see the results, it just inherently puts this belief in everyone that yes, we can do it, we've done it before and we can keep doing it and forever and ever and ever. And the sky is the limit, especially with the background of uh, Kharifa, uh, Burj Khalifa behind you. Of course, um, as long as people speak here in the country, as long as people communicate here in the country, the ICT fund is going to reap, you can say, uh, revenue. And with that revenue, if you know, have the right policymakers to put the right, you can say, policies in place, you can always do this with everyone around you and especially with your people as a country. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll just wrap up here and uh, let Matthew intervene. Thank you. Omar, uh, a, a very motivational and informative talk today. Um, I, I certainly uh, want to thank you and, and the ICT Fund. Um, but before we, we do that, we have a number of questions that have come in. Um, and I'm going to ask everyone that would like to ask a question. We've received your, uh, your personal messages, text, WhatsApp. Uh, thank you very much. If there are additional questions, we're going to run a, a little bit of an extended working group for a few more minutes and take some questions. So please feel free uh, to raise your hand. Uh, and Omar, if you uh, return the uh, screen back to uh, the general screen, we'll also ask everyone uh, to please turn on their camera. 
uh, when they raise their hand and you're called on, uh, please do introduce yourself, uh, but also uh, the organization that you're with. And while we wait for that, um, the, the first question, uh, Omar, that I think uh, we received the most of today, uh, or the most common thread, is that people were, I think, struck by the fact that you outlined ICT Fund's strategic ROI. The fact that uh, you, you discussed the four pillars uh, and that the focus was not on financial ROI, but the strategic ROI. And so as part of that question uh, today, many people are saying, what's missing? How can we help? Uh, so if you are academia, if you are industry, uh, if you are government, uh, what are the labs that ICT Fund is looking at supporting? Where, what, what, can, what are you asking of this group um, for the future uh, when you look forward? How, how can people interact with ICT Fund and uh, support these initiatives? Sure. So, so um, just to give you an uh, insight about our investment pillar. So maybe the ICT Fund hasn't been uh, primarily out there in the, in the limelight because um, most of what we do is on strategic level, and we've been supporting everyone in the country from a student to an entrepreneur to a researcher or a university or even a ministry uh, and, a mis and a minister with, with his project. So, so what we've been trying to do is to look at things on, on a 30,000 feet level and try to create change based on that. When it comes to how, how, can, how can, for example, uh, the members here or the attendees here actually um, be part of this is you can look at if, under which pillar do you fall under and we're bound to have either a, a project which we can do an intro to uh, or in, uh, if you have something relevant or you can uh, ask us if, um, if we as uh, time and time again, we always do it is open up doors for um, companies uh, people, uh, researchers, anyone who would like to be part of this, um, as we can, as this journey of success. Uh, it's a win-win for everyone uh, you know, from abroad and locally. Is we with international players, we luckily we, we've been able to do the Mars mission, the astronaut program, uh, Mars probe, um, the educational system that is one of our biggest investment here in the country, where every student has a device courtesy of ICT Fund. And either you can, you can fall under any of these pillars. And as ICT Fund, we do be more than happy to support you in uh, fostering that relationship with whoever you think is the right fit in the country, either being under the ICT Fund investment or even uh, beyond the ICT Fund uh, partners or, or portfolio of companies. Uh, Omar, can you expand a little bit on that? Uh, the second question um, are, uh, how are the scholarships uh, chosen? Uh, in other words, is it student driven uh, or is it ICT driven? Um, how are the, the scholarship programs identified uh, through ICT fund for universities? Sure. So um, to, to expand on, on supporting um, anyone here across, um, uh, across uh, the board is if uh, say you, you, you're a company and you'd like us to introduce you to the Mohammed Rashid Space Center, We'd more, more than happy to do that. Or the space agency, uh, we have Talan here, who's uh, our previous speaker uh, last session. Uh, or even, even um, if you would like to us to open up doors even to non non ICT fund related, um, you can say uh, companies. Myself personally, I'd be more than happy uh, to support you in that endeavor uh, on a personal level. Uh, as as um, as uh, Matthew mentioned. Um, we're, we're, we're there to have a mutually can say understanding of success that anything we do together, of course, it's for benefit of both of us. Uh, moving on to scholarship. Um, so in terms of scholarship, yes, we, we only provide scholarship related to technology uh, majors, either undergraduate degree or, or postgraduate degree. And we've been doing that uh, for UAE national citizens here in the country. We have about uh, 13 universities in, in the UAE and we only send to the top 100 universities abroad. Uh, we have um, some, of, some, of our, some of our scholarship uh, students are actually part of the Mars mission. Uh, they're doing uh, their master's degree alongside um, building the Mars probe at, uh, when they were at, uh, at uh, and when the phase of the, the Mars probe was at the Colorado um, or the University of Colorado border. 
they they were actually doing their master, Mars, uh, they were doing the master degree in addition to building a Mars probe at the same time. So so we have um, we have you can say different uh, programs, and of course they're focused primarily on technology. We haven't been selective in, at the get-go of launching this program, but uh, at the moment uh, we are trying to, um, you can say, uh, be selective when it comes to what specific majors um, we're going to provide scholarship for. But of course, it's open to all UAE nationals to apply and then um, be granted the scholarship, uh, even if they're working or not working. Uh, they can provide the scholarship as long as they uh, have the prerequisite of uh, a minimal, you can say. Uh, academic performance based on on the scholarship um, uh, criteria. Excellent. Um, we have uh, a time for uh, just a couple more questions. I encourage those that are online to, again, please raise your hand. We'll identify you and we'll bring you online uh, for that live question. Um, the, the next question, um, Omar, goes to really, I think, um, many of the defense space uh, and security companies um, that are working in the UAE that have worked uh, closely to help build the aerospace industry. And, and when you hear, uh, whether it's Airbus or Boeing or Lockheed or uh, many of the other aerospace companies, when they, when they talk about aerospace, they, they have to mention the UAE because the CEOs have, have uh, not only um, recognized the UAE uh, as a global aerospace and space player, um, but have also now invested a lot of uh, time, energy, and um, assets into the UAE. Uh, and so uh, one of the questions comes is in the ecosystem of economic development um, in the UAE, uh, how does the ICT fund either support or collaborate or align um, with programs like uh, Tawazun's offset program or other federal initiatives um, that might seek to help uh, foster support and uh, invest further in, in those um, uh, existing projects that are here in the country. Sure, so um, uh, an example of what you mentioned about Tawazan and the offset program and uh, having, for example, uh, aerospace, aerospace industry affairs. So, so one, of our, um, one of our investments, say the National Art, uh, Space Center and UA University uh, is in talks with the uh, with, with Tawazun and Offset, uh, Offset program uh, team to actually have um, Airbus and Boeing um, be part of that uh, center when it comes to uh, the Offset program. Uh, also, they, uh, we, we actually have a, a, a Tawazun board member. We actually uh, uh, have uh, companies that approach us, but we would then uh, recommend that they be part of our um, portfolio of investment um, partners. Uh, in terms of exploring how they can either partner up or be a provider, supplier, uh, especially when it comes to um, space, there's a lot of missions that are going on at the moment. Some of them are public. For example, um, uh, we have a, a Pan-Arab satellite uh, uh, that uh, is being manufactured at that facility in, in Lorain. Uh, there are some composite, I would assume some composite material. Uh, there could be a supply chain uh, requirement. I'm not too, you can say, uh, privy to the technical, you can say, aspects of that, uh, that um, satellite. Uh, but again, um, we can always explore this um, with every incoming, you can say, uh, request is that um, what, who fits this uh, specifically. But again, um, if you think any of our, um, you can say, four pillars, uh, either through um, having an education program, uh, teaching you a national uh, specific uh, element, or having a specific training program, which you think fits into um, our, our, our program or our, our investment strategy, then yes, uh, we invite it and we would be more than happy to explore this on, on a one-to-one -one basis with whoever you think is the right fit. But again, um, if you think you're, you're in a position where um, we can explore, there's, there, there's no, um, you can say, uh, threshold or bar uh, to explore whatever idea you may have, even if it's out of the blue. Uh, we love moonshots. There's always uh, something to explore. And um, there is, uh, in, in the horizon to come, hopefully with this pandemic, there is a, an exciting um, um, space mission, hopefully, um, to be announced, but we're still waiting for the right time to announce it, or the prime minister to announce it, basically. 
Omar Al Mahmoud, Chief Executive Officer of the ICT Fund, I thank you uh, on behalf of Defense Services Marketing Council, our members, our partners. Uh, thank you very much for the information, for the continued dialogue. Um, thank you to our members. I have to say thank you also for the additional plug for uh, URS Laboratories. Um, on, the, uh, on the working group, the virtual boardroom, we actually have our Emirati lead engineer, uh, Mohammed Al Shamsi. Uh, so I would give him a shout out also, um, who without uh, Emirati engineers uh, teaming up with our startup company, we would have never made it to Drones for Good and all of the other things that came after that, uh, thanks to the support of the UAE leadership and organizations such as yourself. So I do encourage all of those uh, people in attendance today and the organizations to take back the message uh, that Omar has left with us, that we should all be working together in the UAE for those moonshots. Uh, together, we can do anything. Um, again, thank you. Uh, stay safe, stay well, and if you need support, please stay in touch. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great week ahead. Talk to you all soon. Omar, thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Have a great day. Thank you.